Uh, I mean, the, the section, I mean, the, the session is called Lessons from Social and Constitutional Intervention. And uh, in the last panel, when uh, Dr. Sudhir Hindwan was talking about and just listing out the constitutional provisions which empowered and, and gave you a theoretical on paper right to go assert yourself. There was some kind of suspicion about, I mean, are you just giving a kind of a government uh, position and a statist position. But this was, if you see Dr. Ambedkar, this was the criticism against him since 1919 when he makes his first case before the South Borough Commission about talking about Dalits as a separate element in Indian society, not, not Hindus, not Muslims, depressed classes was the word used back then. And he says it's a, a, a separate element and since then, 1930, 31, the roundtable conferences, and then subsequently as uh, executive, uh, as a, a labor member of the Viceroy's Executive Council, Ambedkar had constantly tried to make the state accountable in principle. Because if the state, I mean, b before, before the British came, uh, in one, one of his essays, Gandhi Ranade Jinnah, he talks about how till 1813, till the East India Company said you cannot uh, I mean, you, you cannot say that the Brahmins are exempt from capital punishment. Brahmins in India were exempt from capital punishment. I'm, I'm in principle opposed to capital punishment of any kind. I don't want Brahmins hung. But if there are, there are societal norms which say that, well, everybody can be hung for the pettiest of crime, even some of the crimes for which people were hung involved abusing Brahmins. So if you abuse the Brahmin, you're going to be hung. In, in, this is the kind of legal system which was obtained before. and. Ambedkar saw an opportunity in lobbying with the British government and subsequently with the Congress when an opportunity arose and tried to ensure some guarantees and these are the guarantees which are percolating now. It's difficult for Dalit women to become elected as Panchayat presidents, local body uh, members or even to be a cook in a uh, midday meals scheme uh, project in a school in a village and serve and then and then be abused you know in karnataka there was a case of a woman who was part of the uh, who was a cook in the midday meal project who they they wanted to get rid of her but the, the, she was appointed you could do nothing and then they started and the government backed her saying no no you can't get rid of her then they started spreading the rumor that she has aids now which is another kind of a stigma not that if you are hiv positive if you cook a meal you're going to spread the virus again, again another irrational thing is used against her See, the, why HIV, again, to say that she's a promiscuous woman, uh, why she got HIV, so the, the whole kind of, uh, which is why Ambedkar in his essay, in his kind of speech, 1942, Gandhi, Ran, uh, Ranade and Jinnah, he compares, he's talking about the role of a public intellectual and who is a public intellectual and he chooses Ranade over Gandhi and Jinnah and explains to you why. In that, at one point, he says, uh, I'll just paraphrase him here. He says, society as such can be so oppressive that, you know, government seems like a benign power. People keep talking about how state is an uh, instrument of terror. And, and, our, and my leftist friends are very fond of constantly reminding me that Ambedkar was a statist and that he invested faith in the state. But he had to invest faith in the state because he says, what can be more humiliating than excommunication by society? which is the worst form of humiliation that uh, society can impose on you. And the state sometimes, when it's neutral, when it doesn't want to take a position, and when it's theoretically doesn't even have the, is not equipped to take a position, then it will end up supporting that kind of, uh, the worst kind of punishment as Ambedkar saw it. So constitutional provisions and social movements are linked. The kind of provisions he made in the constitution and in, in interventions earlier to that, stem from his own personal experience. Take the Mahad Satyagraha of 1927, which is simply a social movement to go and assert the right to take water from a well, uh, from, from, a, from a temple tank which is considered sacred, which you're denied the right to go and drink water. So that goes on to inform his larger policy on dams. To, today, in retrospect, you might say big dams are a problem, but uh, Ambedkar did have a role in shaping uh, water policy in India. And, 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 and his interest in water what stems from the fact that he was denied it as a child in a school, and then he realizes that the Mahat Satyagraha is crucial simply as an instrument of going and asserting your rights. And as far as temple entry and Babu was talking about how, you know, 
uh, IHE is not, you know, in a dogmatic way, secularist in the sense we don't support uh, Dalit's right to uh, freedom of religion and their civic right sometimes to go assert the fact that uh, they can worship in the temple. Ambedkar did that too, but when Gandhi started doing temple entry as a Sharad as a way of trying to say that uh, of incorporating Dalits into Hinduism, he immediately saw through the game and he said, "There's no point in doing this when we did it in uh, uh, when, when we did it in uh, the, the Mahat Kalaram uh, Temple Satyagraha. We did it simply to say that we have a right to go there. We have a right to go there and say hi to your God and then come back. But you cannot stop us from doing that." When you stop us from doing that, we'll do that. But doesn't mean we want to be there, become priests there, uh, become part of your religion. So there's a kind of, you know, and, and where do you provide the guarantee to this? In the constitution, in something that's legal. So that you can go to court of law. Ambedkar was a trained lawyer. He was thinking about being a social activist, plus how to ensure that your social activism is translatable into something that is legal. So there is there is a bind between social 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 activism and there is a connect between social activism and constitutional intervention. His con he, he was an interventionist interventionist both in, in 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 the realm of society and in the realm of governance and policy making and law. So that is that is that is what is creating and and the point he always used to make is about creating a crisis in society. As long as you don't create crisis in society, you cannot have change. And when you have laws like this the 73rd Amendment Act, the Panchayati Raj Act, which creates a crisis in society. How society deals with it is a secondary issue. Uh, how so society is regressive. You have to, it, it, will, it will try to oppose a Dalit man or a Dalit woman, and now there are 33% of these posts are reserved for them. What do you do? Okay, you will say, we will get a, get hold of a uh, Sukkan, like in Tamil Nadu they did, who will be my uh, slave, he will do what. After 10 years, Sukhan is not going to keep listening to the landlord. He might just do one little thing which tilts the balance and makes the landlord upset and the Dalits might get angry. There might be a little clash, what is called a caste riot. And it might change things for the better. So this is the crisis that constitutional interventions can create and have created successively. There is bloodbath, there is sometimes loss of life. But one learns from these crises and then moves on. Otherwise there is stasis. You are not going to change at all. So, so it is necessary to mix what uh, Dr. Hindwan was talking about earlier and have and give th these kind of legal interventions, empower social activists to go fight for the right. I mean, take the Right to Information Act, which has been in India uh, since the last Congress government in the Common Minimum Program was there. That has, that has resulted in a hell of a lot of uh, activism and ability to extract information from the government, which it otherwise is uh, very unwilling to part with. So now over to, we do not have the person in case you're holding on to this paper, Vikas Gora is not here. We instead have Gurinder Singh Azad, who is a board member of the International Humanist and Ethical Youth Organization. And he is based in Delhi and he is the coordinator of Tarkshil Society of Punjab. And he also says he's a Dalit activist. And what really interests me about his work is he has worked on superstitions in Punjab for the last eight years and he runs a kind of a psycho-social counseling center to treat people, particularly Dalit women, who are supposed to possess evil spirits. I mean, this is one way of saying that you're a witch being branded a witch. This happens quite often. You're branded a witch and then you can be beaten, you can be lynched. Dalit communities themselves are sometimes unfortunately involved in these incidents. Lots of tribal communities in Jharkhand are involved in these incidents where they take it out on their own women folk. Uh, for all, or if you really go down deep into the case, you will find that that woman had asserted a right to own property after her husband's death, whereas the brother-in-laws and others were trying to take it. This might be the root cause. You will say, you should be an evil woman to even talk like that. You must be a witch to even think that you can own property. So, this is where the whole genesis would be. It would be a very material, uh, reasonable issue which might if you take it to a court of law, she might win. But society takes over, beats them up, brands them, and there you have the case.